This is Mike Goldberg, the voice of Bellator MMA. Great to be podside once again. Set to enter the podcast right now. Our tale of the tape, the current undefeated champion of the world, Captain Hooter, defending his title once again. And I can tell you, no champion has ever defended his podcast this many times. Well, since podcast began. Can he do it again? Let's find out. Here we go! It's Captain Hooter. Hello. Dzień dobry. Bon dia. Dobre utra. Dobre utra. It is our sir, Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We look up acting. Buenos dias. Hello. Everybody online looking good. Morning. So what do you crap? Good night and Dobro Horanko. Bon dia. Como Maria. What's happening, everyone? It is Captain Hudo-san, and I am here playing Disc Ninja. I'm actually here getting my practice on. And you know, today's guest is all about practice. It's all about practice, it's all about research, and it's all about learning to master your craft. And today's guest is Russ Hudson. And if anybody has mastered his craft, it's Russ Hudson. So I'm going to be here practicing my tosses, trying to get my my skill on. And while I'm doing this, see, too much. Come on now. Yes. Uda-san, your battle with the Frisbee is extraordinary. No, it's not. That sucked. Come on, I can do better now. Come on now. Bam! There it is. Okay, you guys enjoy this interview with Russ Hudson. I'm going to get my practice on, and when you come back, we're going to get a chance to see what this looks like when you're actually playing a game. Very cool. All right, see you guys in a little bit. Hola, hola, everyone. Captain Hooter here, coming to you once again, very high and very alive and very excited today to have uh, one of my early mentors, somebody who's helped me from the very beginning, a uh, gentleman who is a cannabis expert, a cannabis researcher. He is the creator of uh, marijuanagames.org, which is the first place that I found him. He has, uh, I think it's Cannabastard. Is it the Cannabastard? Sure. Cannabastard.com. He has just got a brand new book called The Big Book of Terpenes, which is a big ass book. And it's got all kinds of great information into it. We're going to find out all about it right now. I am thrilled to introduce you to Mr. Russ Hudson. How are you, sir? Hola, buenas. Mucho gusto. Thank you, Captain Hooter. It's great to talk to you after, man, it's been, I think, um, 2017. Yeah, um, yeah. When you were writing for The Rooster, right? Uh, the, the first one, I was coming in for uh, Cannabis Culture. Cannabis Culture Magazine was the first one that I was doing the story on uh, Spanibus. And right. uh, you, you helped me tremendously, told, directed me right to the correct places I need to be all around Barcelona, and uh, also explained the correct protocols and procedures right. that I needed to go through, and it made all the difference in the world. How, how long were you doing that? Um, and for how many zillions of people did you help out in that town? Um, I mean, it was tens of thousands over the years. I, I started it in 2013, and um, I... Uh, basically moved out of it in um, 2019. So um, the end of 2018, early 2019 is when I sold marijuana games and really um, started on the Big Book of Terps, which took about three years um, of research. So I really wasn't doing much else during that entire time, um, which is why I kind of, I you know wasn't really in um, the media so much anymore. In those days, I was in the media quite a bit. 
Um, and then there were years of silence while I was um, nose deep in thousands of studies um, about terpenes and, and flavonoids. Um, so I don't really work with the cannabis clubs um, of Spain um, and not much with the coffee shops of the Netherlands anymore either. Um, you know, I'm focusing on, on the science now uh, and that's where I wanted to be then. I've always wanted to talk about cannabis from a, a position um, of, of science and that's kind of been my whole shtick really. Yeah, it's, and you have had one of the most amazing uh, careers. You truly are a rags to riches story. Um, you know, I, I've been having everyone, I had Mila come on as well and say, you know, yeah, if, if, I were to, if I were to meet you in an elevator for the first time and nobody knew who you were um, and you had to do your, your elevator pitch and I met you in the elevator for the first time, how would you introduce yourself now? Um, I mean, I don't really tell people what I do straight off the cuff, right? Um, because it, it would depend on what, what elevator, right? In what that. city and, and in what building, right. um, <laughs> there is still a lot of resistance Wise. to cannabis and a stranger meeting in the elevator. I, I probably would reserve that unless there was some reason to get into that. Now, if I was in business mode, then I'm going to be wearing a pin. Uh, and in that case, I would probably just say I, I'm a cannabis consultant. Um, I research molecules and help people win licenses. Yeah. And you and, and that's very humble of you. Very kind. Um, you, you I mean, I, I was just kind of browsing through the, the basic uh, 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 information that was in the new book and my mm -hmm. jaw was dropping. I mean, you are, you're, you're doing some work here that I think is so very important. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, what the focus is, uh, especially about the synergy part? Yeah, um, so the Big Book of Terps is a 580-page um, scientific textbook um, focusing on terpenes and flavonoids um, in cannabis um, and, and the synergy um, related to that, which is separate from the entourage effect. Um, something that I think is important that we need to distinguish between, which I make that distinguishing um, um, remarks in the synergy chapter. So um, much of it is focused on research in other plants because we haven't done a whole lot of research about specific um, phytochemicals in cannabis other than the cannabinoids. So much of the research has been focused on cannabinoids. So I chose with this book to stay completely away from cannabinoids, although I did write a chapter um, for this book about cannabinoids because it is important to have that base understanding. Um, and so really the idea was to um, move away a little bit from the single molecule approach. Um, it's been obvious to me in my long um, career and personal use of cannabis that there's so much more to just THC. Right, we had THC as the silver bullet, and now CBD is the silver bullet, and now people are talking CBG, and, and kind of like one molecule at a time, focusing on, on the cannabinoids. Um, I knew years ago that that didn't make sense. There, there wasn't enough um, basis there to sort of make a claim to all these different effects that cannabis has on so many different people in so many different ways, and, and very inconsistent, you know, like even, uh, and what set me off initially on this research was I have experienced time and time again where I can smoke, say, some really crappy um, like Mexican brown weed from way back in the day. Right. And you get a little bit high, but then after a while it, it stops working again. And then maybe you get your hands on some really nice um, premium stuff like that BC bud that was coming out of Canada in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And you get really, really high. But after about two weeks, you also reach a plateau where it doesn't work for you the way that it did before. However, you could go back to smoking that brown Mexican stuff and you right. would get very high and feel great. Mm -hmm. So I've known for a long time that there's, there's more to it. And um, in my work with, with cannabis, uh, you know, especially with cannabis social clubs and, and more of the cultural sort of things, I again and again ran into the hyperbole of the cannabis industry. And in and, and those days, especially the resistance to move the science forward. Um, about 10 years ago, I wrote an article, um, something about you know, becoming a, a cannabis connoisseur. And I talked about how in the early days when I was talking about indica and sativa, which are now sort of in question as to whether we should be using those terms or not, I would kind of get chastised by people that I was buying weed from. They'd be like, who gives a shit? It's weed, just smoke yes. it. Do you want to buy it or yes. not? Uh, and so there was a definite resistance 
to science because I think it, it made people feel dumb. And the reason that people felt dumb is because they had never heard of this stuff before. So my goal is I want you to hear about it. I want you to understand what the actual science is of cannabis so that we can stop looking like Cheech and Chong portrayed us back in the 60s and 70s. <laughs> and more importantly, if we're selling this plant as medicine, then we need to be able to understand what it is we're talking about. How do you go and get your medicine? How do you know what's good for you when, as you mentioned in, in some of my work, I talk about how strain reviews are, are nonsense. Why? Because you don't have a strain. There's no such thing as a strain. Even one feel of cannabis, if you test the back corner that was exposed to aphids, it's going to probably test higher for pharnacine than the front corner that didn't have aphids. So how are you smoking the same strain from a chemical standpoint? Yeah. You're not. So therefore, it's more important to understand what are the actual chemical compounds that I need, right? Like for me, I, I beta caryophyllene is the primary terpene that I, and it's also a cannabinoid that I'm trying to get in my diet. Um, uh, terpinaline also is great for me. Myrcene for when I'm looking for, for something sedative. So the average person right now doesn't know what they need. They just know that at one time, super lemon haze worked really good for them yeah. from that one place and they may not understand why it doesn't really work in the way that it used to and why it's so inconsistent from one place to the next so that was the idea of this book is um if we're going to have these conversations we're going to push the medical angle of legalization and we're going to actually help people therapeutically we have to have a basic understanding of what do we need from this plant and for the most part it's not just THC and not just CBD. You, I, I love your what your website, uh, the uh, uh, the can of bastard. It, I love because there is so much truth in that in that site, and it is truly an education for. Uh, a, a lot of the people that are coming into this and starting to move up in the industry, you need to read all of his stories. There, can can you talk a little bit about like some of the the, the like the number one uh, myths uh, or or uh, 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 fabrications that that you've heard over the years. Uh, let's just take one area. Let's just take Spain, uh, the Spain uh, clubs. Yeah, I mean the biggest myth about the Spanish cannabis clubs is that it's um, Spanish sun grown weed, right? Total bullshit. If you can find cannabis at a social club in Spain that especially in the big cities in the smaller cities yes of course there's sun-grown weed there but in the big cities it's definitely not sun-grown cannabis why it's way too risky outdoor operations in Spain are targeted all the time it's very easy to find them we had to um, bury shipping containers underground and build cultivation centers within them in Spain because it was the only way to be safe growing way outside the city centers so the social clubs in Spain have two types, of, three types of product, really. One is product that comes um, from the Netherlands and is brought down in trucks. Um, one is product that comes from California or supposedly it comes from California. This stuff um, is, is nothing that I would ever smoke, um, um, but it's very popular because it's labeled as Californian um, grown. And very expensive. A crazy expensive, unjustifiably expensive. And, and then you have the third type of cannabis at most cannabis social clubs, which is cannabis that is grown by maybe not necessarily the club, sometimes the club, but often interests that support the club. So growers networks, which is the same thing that's been happening for 60 years in the Netherlands, mm -hmm. supplier networks supply the clubs. Yeah. Often clubs will have indoor grows, but they have like just one or two or three grows, maybe like 10 lamp operations here and there because you can get caught with a 10 lamp operation and you're going to be okay. Nobody's going to go to jail, especially if you have them spread out and you have three operations and, and one gets um, busted, then you're still fine. Uh, and just for people who, who are watching in Spain, um, cannabis cultivation is not legal. Cannabis social clubs um, are legal only because they're a private setting and what you do in private is, is none of anybody's business. So those are really the three types of cannabis that you see at cannabis social clubs in Spain. So this whole idea that you can go to cannabis social clubs in Spain and sample all this beautiful sun-grown cannabis is, at least in my experience until the time I left Spain, um, which was 2019, an absolute lie. I only came across in Barcelona and Madrid actual sun-grown cannabis very rarely, and it was sold as crap. Like, 
it was four euro a gram. It wasn't taken seriously. It's just like, what cheap shit do you want? Oh, I got this sun grown crap here. And so I think that that's something that needs to be corrected because it should be sun grown cannabis that we're smoking at cannabis social clubs in Spain. Right. And if it was done right, it could be among the best cannabis in the world. But um, I think that's one of the most common myths that is just is never never talked about. What do you think is the possibility of, of it ever being decriminalized there? I mean, you know, we had the La Rosa Verde project that we worked on um, back in um, 2016, 2015, um, and um, resulted in legislation in Catalonia that was approved. So in Europe, we actually had the first legal legislated cannabis on the books, but Catalonia made another failed bid for independence Madrid came in, they crushed our government, they removed all of our officials, and they quashed all of our legislation and were forced to adopt um, federal. So since then, nothing has happened. Um, it's not really a big topic of discussion right now. It's difficult to move forward. Spain, in general, the industry has not pushed the medical angle like, um, uh, you know, in Canada and the United States. Um, it's a different conversation. And because the cannabis clubs have been so successful for so long, and, and again, very rarely does anybody ever go to jail um, for being associated with these clubs, um, the situation is okay. You can acquire good cannabis at a cannabis social club safely. They're really great environments, but without having the legal mechanism, it's all the supporting people who are at jeopardy, right? Like the guys in the grows, they're in danger. It's the same thing in the Netherlands. Yeah. You can go to a coffee shop and it's cool. Well, it's tolerated. You know, it, it's the same thing there. Yeah. There's no such thing as it being legally okay to consume cannabis in the Netherlands. And that's another thing that most people don't know. It is not legal. It's tolerated very openly. In Spain, it's also tolerated, but not really openly. It's mm -hmm. a different kind of situation. Um, I think Spain has a way to go. Again, I haven't been as deeply connected there as I was before, but I think we're talking at least several years before we could have a situation where there would be a big movement towards some type of, of legalization. And part of that is because depending on how you legalize, you could do like what Canada did. Canada legalized cannabis, right? They also created like 60 something new laws to send people to jail over about yeah. cannabis. And the same thing could happen in Spain. Depending on how you approach legalization, you could completely fuck up the whole cannabis social club system and make that system fail. It's a beautiful system and we don't want that to happen. <clears throat> so it's anybody's guess at this stage what, what is going to happen. The cannabis social clubs in the big cities have been struggling since COVID. Many of them had to close down. Um, <clears throat> You know, um, as we sort of initially met through the whole cannabis social club tourism industry, which uh, is in those days was massive in Barcelona and now has spread to to a lot of the rest of Spain and, and justifiably so. Right. People should be able to safely access cannabis when they're traveling or, or whatever. Um, so I think we're a ways off, man. But I'm going to go um, back within the next year, I think, um, and do some extended work there. Um, and I have been keeping tabs um, on things there a little bit. So um, I think you'll see a, a resurgence of my work in Spain within the next uh, four, uh, 24 months. Wow, that would be fantastic. Um, the, you know, the, the last uh, few trips that I've made down, I've been going down south, as I, I mentioned yeah. before, to a place that I had never been before, which was down in Huelva, Spain. And I have to say the buds that I've been finding there have just been so beautiful. And here's another thing, and it's something that I know you're going to appreciate, and I've never seen it anywhere else in the world. At one of the clubs, I uh, believe it's Dr. Green's, on their, uh, their, their menu, on some of their cultivars, it'll list something like um, uh, Tequila Sunrise, uh, Sativa, uh, uh, they'll, they might say, uh, they'll, they don't use uh, actual terpenes, but they'll say uh, lemon uh, uh, booster. Mm -hmm. Then here's the thing that was on there and it was on several of the others. Cured 23 weeks, cured 18 weeks, cured 20 weeks, cured 16 weeks. The curing times were on the menu. Interesting. Oh, it is I, and and I the smile that went to my face, you know, right away. I went now, 
this is this is an important piece of information that should yeah. be on here and it right. is a selling tool and yeah. and you wrote a fantastic uh, uh piece on uh, i don't remember which which one, i think it was over on on, on um uh can of bastard about curing and how important and, and uh, the spanish in particular had to be uh uh patient in the united was, states the average is, is two weeks you know when we run cannabis license applications and we talk about what cultivators are doing to the state that's the message that they're sending is they'll be curing for two weeks so to hear 24 weeks is great but what i really want to know and i'm hoping to open a laboratory soon to find out we need to test like this cannabis that you saw that was 24 week cure we need to test it at harvest, then at two weeks at cure, which is when it would generally go to market. Then at 24 weeks, we need to test it again and compare so that we know what is the difference and why. Because fresh cannabis may be good for many people. Aged cannabis may be good for other people. I've always been a big fan of aged cannabis. Uh, I'm, you know, old heads in the industry. They always have that jar of that special stuff that they've been curing for like two or three years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that shit is amazing wow. it's it's a little bit brown and it's lost its youthful luster mm -hmm. um but the properties the chemical properties are different so that's what we need to know at least in in my opinion that's where i want to go is what are those chemical differences right and like i mentioned to you before i'm very visual and i'm very yeah. microscopic so what i find is like when i start looking at the trichome heads under those buds that were cured for 24 weeks i'm mm -hmm. finding a little amber but I'm finding all kinds of different types of color and action happening inside those trichome heads. Not just clear, not just cloudy, but now I'm, I, and if I do any kind of playing with any of my, my black lights or, you know, mm -hmm. I, can, I can truly see chemical activity happening or that has already taken place in there. And I can just, you know, and again, big fat, you know, trichome heads are just, thank you. I'll be there all day long. <clears throat> I love it. Um, I wanted to ask you, because uh, I, I had Dr. Uh, Mary uh, Clifton in mm -hmm. uh, not too long ago, who's fantastic, and we had a wonderful conversation about uh, CBDs, and uh, two of the things that came up was THCO and THCP. Um, yeah. Those are new to me. Okay, uh, moving on. Nanotechnology for water with uh thc have you been doing any work with that i just i just started to look into it and, and um the little bit that i read i i went away still not understanding yeah and that was prompted by a, a recent trip to to colorado where i got some um wana products that are um they're they're fast acting gummies right mm -hmm. so i'm gonna pull one out of my desk here give me one second fast acting is in how long 15 minutes 15 minutes okay yeah okay it's not focusing but there you go. so okay. these are wanna quick apple teeny fast acting gummies um and it says um while traditional edibles are metabolized in the liver wanna quick gummies use nano encapsulation technology to send yes. thc straight to your bloodstream mm -hmm. the result a faster lighter shorter high right. um I don't get it. So, so here's the thing uh, that right now in the Netherlands, did you ever get a chance to meet Renus? Renus, no. uh, uh, Renus Bientema, and I, I always say his name terrible. Uh, he's the founder of Suvernuver, which was the medical uh, oil company that was servicing about 30 or 40,000 people in the Netherlands. Okay. And uh, he was, he was making, you know, hardcore oils for people uh fighting ready to go to jail uh yeah. fight the power all the way through went to all the way to court had it you know ready to go and they found him guilty but didn't punish him what they mm -hmm. said though is he can't make the oil anymore and mm -hmm. what he was able to do is do this conversion over into and they're using hemp um up for this which right. makes it completely legal within mm -hmm. the netherlands and they've created a aqua light or aqua day and one night. And they're doing exactly that, encapsulating the, the, the molecules, THCO, inside mm -hmm. this, bypassing the liver, going right into the bloodstream. And I had no experience with this. And then the uh, day before yesterday, I spoke with a gentleman who's been uh, on it, for, who is a 
hardcore smoker who's been smoking yeah. and i've known him for a while and he says this, and, and i feel like he says bra he's a young guy bra this shit's the bomb he says mm -hmm. it and it hits you right away uh, and he says that i've got it in different levels here so you can get uh milligram you know jumps uh from there and he yeah. says it he says it's the shit he says one of my favorite ways to get high right now is 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 drinking this water mm -hmm. i need some <laughs> I, I don't know. These don't do anything for me. I, I you know, I, I bought a bunch of different edibles and, you know, was fairly careful about comparing them and seeing which ones work. Um, just as a shout out, the N-Fuse edibles um, oh. gummies are, they're amazing. They yes. taste great, very high quality food ingredients. They work really well. Um, these Wanas, Wana is a really big company. I expected more. They do nothing for me. I got several different kinds and um, they're not only not quick acting, but in general, they just, they didn't work. Are you a dabber? Do you dab? No, no. no? I've, I've been flower um, only, uh, except um, I prefer isolator, but um, it's, or bubble hash. Um, mm -hmm. But it's often really hard to get because, um, you know, in Europe, it's isolator and it's very expensive. In the United States, they use it for processing. So it's just usually not available as a product. But um, so for most of my life, I always smoked and I preferred to smoke out of a bomb. But about um, two months ago, I was having a lot of trouble with coughing, coughing up nasty stuff all the time. I knew it was because I was smoking bongs all day long. Um, so I gave up flour um, going on two months ago now, and mm -hmm. I've been, um, you know, working on these little vape pens and stuff just to give myself. Do you like them? Do you like the? They're vapes? okay. They don't get me high like flour does, but I'm not really interested in smoking flour. Um, it's just there's too much going in that I don't need. I don't need all those particulates um and and so often like i'm in virginia now um and often here we have to acquire cannabis from unknown sources and, and right. who knows what's yeah. in it so um yeah i i haven't really been doing flower um dabs never work for me did dabs a lot in all the clubs and i don't know it sometimes gets me high but not in the way that i want to be yeah okay um how about cbd does nothing for me Interesting. Uh, I, I'm I'm the same way. I, uh, yeah. uh, uh, Dr. Mary said it's good to smoke anyway because it's a balance. It helps to balance uh, your system and allow you to get more out of your THC at a later time. But to me, it's almost like eating vegetables with no butter or cheese sauce on it. it it's just, ugh. I just yeah. can't, can't get it down my gullet. You know what I mean? No, I get that. And, you know, I, I reviewed several thousand studies on, on, on these and, and related topics. And I think Ethan Russo's work in this regard really is, is the best is that CBD <clears throat> from what I have seen, and I know so many people have medical benefits of CBD and that's great that it works for them. It doesn't work for me and it doesn't work for a number of other people like me. Um, but CBD, according to Ethan Russo, is a modulator of THC. And that seems to be what it is best at, is operating in unison with THC. Whether you're talking about for recreational purposes or, or medical purposes, they seem to go best together. So why we went from THC, singular molecule, silver bullet theory, to suddenly CBD, silver, um, silver bullet theory, I don't know, because the actual research says that they're best when they're together. Mm -hmm. And then the bigger the macro research says that it's best when they're all together, when you have the cannabinoids and the terpenes and the flavonoids and the ketones and the esters and the thiols and the sulfur, uh, all of that has medical value. You know, if you look at the medical value of flavonoids alone, it's, it's fucking mind blowing. Like flavonoids almost put terpenes to shame as far as their documented medical value. Um, so I don't know about CBD. I do know, for instance, um, uh, I did a documentary with Vice back in 2015. And yes. um, the producer, this guy, Yago, really cool guy, wasn't into cannabis. He just never had been. But he puffed on a CBD pen most of the day. And I remember asking him, like, what does it do? I don't get it. I don't understand CBD because it does nothing for me. And he says that it, it doesn't make him high, but it makes him just feel more calm. 
So like he would come to a meeting and he would be kind of like anxious and jittery and maybe moving around a little bit, but then he takes a few puff from the CBD pen and he's not high, but now he's calmer. Mm -hmm. And so it does seem to work for other people. I, it doesn't for me. Yeah. It's interesting. Cause you know, I, I, I uh, did a, a thing called the uh, cannabinoid protocol from Dr. Mary and mm -hmm. looked at all of the benefits of, of THC and uh, CBDs. And, you know, there was, there's some wonderful uh, research that came out uh, several months ago that had to do with uh, uh, CBD having something to do with the, uh, uh, the receptors and helping to control the cytokine, cytokine storm uh, mm -hmm. during the, the thing. And of course, right away, all the, all the CBD companies came out with COVID buster uh, right. CBD uh, joints all over the place. You know, out of, in your career, you've seen some crazy shit. What's, what's the most bizarre kind of shenanigans you've seen? You know, uh, with the, I, I've seen, we'll talk about, the, it's, stay in your field. So terpene yeah. with just yeah. like some of the things rotating around the there. craziest thing that I see is there are companies that say they're terpene companies they produce products and this happens all the time and and I partly feel bad but I also get super annoyed they send me a product they want me to try it their company is a terpene company has terpenes in the name they're all about terpenes the product doesn't tell you which terpenes there's no COA that tells you which terpenes and on their websites they don't mention specific terpenes almost at all this is really common and it is just bad behavior. Like how can you be a company that produces, for instance, a, a terpene infused beverage, mm -hmm. but you don't say which terpenes, why would a consumer give a shit mm -hmm. if they can't know which terpene they're talking about? Because personally, I don't care. Also, how am I supposed to review your product or give you any feedback if I don't know what terpenes are supposedly in it? and then how it makes me feel. It's just all very vague. And so what's happening is people in the terpene industry are seizing on the fact that terpenes are trendy and that's it. And those companies are gonna come and go. And, and you know this is what we've seen many of the CBD folks as well, or particularly in hemp all along the East Coast, those hemp farmers that grew tons of, of hemp for CBD lost everything um, because they jumped on a fad before we really had a good understanding of what's going on. So yeah, that in terpenes is, is really bad behavior and, and it, it irks me because I'm sent products and I'm expected to evaluate them and it's impossible without knowing which terpene. If you're a terpene company and you're not listing individual terpenes and you're not talking about terpenes on your website, you're not a terpene company. Yeah, exactly. You know, I had uh, uh, from Tricom, I had uh, Brandon Allen on. And, yeah. you know, he has that great cooking uh, course, uh, cooking with uh, cannabis. And yeah. uh, I just had the stoner chef on and we were talking about having a terpene cooking kit. Do, do you have anything you've seen any of these companies yet that have, has come out with a great kit for cooking? So I, I've got the aromatherapy kit from uh, uh, Abstracts. I, yeah, I cool. can do this, which I, which I love. Um, but that's that's for your 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 aroma. It's not right. for cooking. Have you seen anything that's really great that's already out there? I haven't, and and I wonder about those things, right? So, if you apply heat to a monoterpene, what's going to happen? It's gone. It should, yeah, they volatilize at very low temperatures. So, and this is a problem for for cannabis curing and, and storage as well. Is that it's very hard to to maintain those monoterpenes, and we're attributing so many health benefits to these terpenes, these monoterpenes, but in most cases, they're probably not remaining in the product. So I think if, if you look at foods as a source of terpenes, which you should, it should be the biggest source of terpenes. We really shouldn't be looking at cannabis to source terpenes. That's ridiculous. We should be looking at cannabis to source cannabinoids. But if you look at um, those types of foods, the best ones are going to be all the citrus fruits. Um, yeah. pine nuts, green peppers, carrots are rich in terpenes, celery is rich in terpenes, pound for pound. Those are the foods that you want to eat and, and you don't really want to cook them because when you cook them, we're talking about volatile molecules, you're going to cook them out. And unless you do things like, um, you know, if you boil carrots, say, and, and drink the water afterward, then you're retaining some of that nutritional value. But I often wonder even up through the sesquiterpenes and diterpenes and the more stable terpenes, 
how much of that is being retained in the food once you cook it? I, I think the answer is probably very little. I don't have the science on that. Again, I'm gonna open a laboratory and I wanna look into that. But I think for the most part, these chefs should be talking about eating raw, raw foods. Mm -hmm. There you go. If you want to, if you want to truly get the the, the terpene expression, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, backtrack and tell you my funny uh, most outrageous uh, terpene thing that I saw while I was in uh, Amsterdam. I had a sample that I received that uh, was a Skittles, and I ended up getting several grams of it. And it went, as soon as I smelled it, right away, boom. That was like opening up a package of Skittles. I've never smelled anything that was that dead on. Of course, what I've learned is when something's too dead on now, that should be a warning sign. And sure enough, as I got this bud under the microscope and started looking at it, I started finding circles and colors, red, orange, <laughs> yellow, <laughs> blue. They had actually poured Skittles candy in with the bag when they were curing it and uh which is you know nothing surprises me anymore but uh at, at the same time talk about shenanigans eh <laughs> this is what they're doing here in, in virginia like um if you go and get a bag of gummies so uh, virginia is not legal here but you can go and get a bag of like these weed tarts yeah so these are basically like trying to be smarties mm -hmm. um I know the laboratory, the guys that own the laboratory that analyze all these products, and they have confirmed that what is being done is they're just spraying on the candy. So basically you have candy and then they spray on the, the Delta 8 or the Delta 10 solution. Mm -hmm. And so they could also do that and say, oh, it's Skittles, right? Because they could have a formulation that they could just literally spray on. Mm -hmm. And I think the proof is always in the pudding. When you smoke that stuff, Anybody who knows is going to know. You know, and that, that kind of leads beautifully into one of the other things that I have so much admiration for you about. You wrote another great piece talking about cannabis cup judging. And, you know, you've done judged a bunch of cups. I've judged a ton of cups. And I think you are just so dead on the numbers. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, some of the things you think that really should be in place with these cannabis cups when you're judging going forward? Yeah, um, you know, my my general feeling on that at the time. And this was after um, I was actually at a, a Dabadu in Barcelona. Um, Mila was there and there were some other, you know, important cannabis people there. And, and so we're judging the Dabadu. But basically, you have to take like 25 concentrates and in the course of three hours, consume and try them all. <laughs> and I just remember thinking, this is this is ridiculous. There's no way to quantify any of this. And that, you know, made me harken back to every other cup that I've been to and every event that I've been to. Um, and I talked to a lot of judges, um, like uh, Paris Mato um, in, mm. in Barcelona. Um, mm -hmm. And we talked about this a lot, where you're, you're just required to oh, sample like 60 samples of flour. And they give you sometimes like a day or two days to do it. And although, yes, you can eliminate some of them right away because you're like, I'm not smoking that shit. It's brown. Yeah. It's got webs in it. I can see with my eyeballs. I don't want to smoke it. But over those 60 samples, you're probably going to have to test out 40 of them. And after, you know, as you were talking earlier, after the first two or three, it doesn't matter. After the first one, it doesn't matter, right? If you really want to subjectively test cannabis, it should be that type only that day. Yeah. And then there needs to be like a clearing period because THC is fat soluble. We have all that shit still in our fat cells. How much of what you feel tomorrow when you sample a different strain is actually from what you were Let feeling them. the day before. We don't really know because cannabis has not been um, researched properly for so long. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I think the way to do it would be uh, ideally one judge judges one or two or three strains over a period of, of maybe three or four weeks because you need to try them in different situations. You know, just because I, I smoke some Jack Herrer today in a setting in my backyard where it's a beautiful day and there's a nice breeze and I'm just chill. I smoke that Jack Herrer today just because I feel one way today doesn't mean that when I smoke that literal same Jack Herrer from the same bag tomorrow, in a high anxiety producing situation that I'm gonna feel the same. So 
I think you need to consistently test the strain. It needs to be done over a period of time. You need to go to bed with it. You need to wake up with it. You need to eat with it. You need to have sex with it. You need to go to work with it. If you're that type of person, which I am, cannabis is in my life, I'm smoking right now. Mm -hmm. um, then, you know, how do you quantify those effects without really studying them? Yeah. Because we, we don't have these, these answers yet. And yeah, there you go. Um, so I think that judging really needs to change. I, I'm, I'm happy to hear, as you were talking about earlier, where they, they had you sequestered for 10 days. Mm -hmm. um, I think those tests also need to be done. And, and that testing period needs to be done with COAs in your hand. Yeah. If you, as the judge, are judging a strain and yeah. you don't understand the phytochemical content, it's so subjective. It has, I question the meaning, right, right. of all these different judges saying their subjective effects of the same exact strain. Right. And again, I could take that bag of Jack Hair. I could give you some. I could give my partner some. I could take some. And we could all report totally different effects. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to judging, it's like, I don't really know. I don't know. How do you really judge the best strain out of 40 strains submitted? Damn. You know, I, I can tell you from the, the last cup I did was probably the most, the one I, I will appreciate and I, I was the most legit that I've ever done, which was the, the Jack Herrera Cup in Amsterdam. And yeah. I, I, you know, we had a, a wide range, a wide range of super talented uh, judges that were there. We were in this great building. Uh, where we were able to all be focused on what we were doing. I was in one of the side, I was in the recreation room because I had all my microscopes and I was taking photos. I photographed every single sample. And because that's, that's my main tell, right? And, but I had the, uh, the, I had the advantage of being able to interact with a, a fellow uh, interpreter, uh, Herb Greeny. Uh, who you might have seen doing some of my bud reports on on the show, who is a true master has, you know, he's a true cannabis uh, sommelier. And we discuss um, from the interpreting aspect rather than from the, the names, which is great because we don't have the names anyway. So this is what we do naturally. And being able to work off of each other was just phenomenal. And um, awesome. I, 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 and having the period of time to absorb. So nobody was was being rushed to have to smoke and consume all at the same time. It makes all the difference in the world. Absolutely. Um, so you're going on tour right now with your book, right? You're, you've got quite a few events coming up in the... Yeah, um, I, I don't know how much of a, a tour it's going to be because actually um, we just produced version 1.5 already. I'm waiting uh, wow. on a proof copy for that. Um, and within the next 90 days, we're gonna push an actual full second edition um, Ed Rosenthal and um, Max Montrose will be on board for the second edition of the Big Book of Terps. Wow. And almost immediately thereafter, we'll publish the formidable book of flavonoids, which will be the world's biggest textbook about flavonoids and with a focus on cannabis and synergy. Um, and then within 12 months of that, we're going to publish the Big Book of Keys. And that's ketones, alcohols, esters, and sulfur in cannabis. For that, we need to open a laboratory because there's no data to write anything from. So we need to create that data. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna do a bunch of, of speaking events. Um, I'm also a, um, in, a cannabis licensing um, firm, uh, Can Advisors. I, I do consulting with them um, mm -hmm. and I'll be with them um, in New York City for CWCBE um, the 2nd, 3rd and 4th of June. And then um, various other events that's on the events page of the Big Book of Terps sure. com. So uh, the other thing I was going to ask you, because you're more, you're, you're like me, you're always looking for the newest, coolest, neatest uh, thing. What is going to be the next big thing, do you think? Is it going to be the, the, the atomizers that are the inhalers? We talked about that with Mark Emery. <laughs> 10 milligrams yeah. a pop, uh, inhalers uh, uh, in the nose. Uh, have you seen anything that's really, you went, oh, those are going to be awesome. No, I think, I mean, there's so much innovation to come in, in cannabis. Um, I think that what is going to be the most exciting, at least for me, is that this has set the stage to talk about psychedelics. Oh. And that's what's next, I think, is the medical and therapeutic value of psychedelics. Um, you know, cannabis is considered a, a psychedelic compound, or at least it is by, by many and, and 
um, psychedelic rock was fueled mostly by, by cannabis, of course, and, and LSD and mushrooms. But I think that that's the, the next new thing. I think we're going to keep talking about cannabis molecules. Um, what I'm going to try to push for is let's talk about them holistically. Let's stop focusing on one at a time. Let's get this conversation going mm -hmm. um, and get the information out there so that people can actually make informed decisions about what they're putting in their body. Um, but this is all setting the stage for, for psychedelics to take a, a big place in culture. If we can get that far, um, if we don't collapse politically um, <laughs> or, you know, um, who knows what could happen. But if we keep advancing at this rate, then I think in, you know, Oregon and Colorado and other places are, are already looking at it. They're already doing it. I think um, legalization of psychedelics is the next big thing. And that's going to be on the backs of what we've done uh, in cannabis. Yes, I agree 100%. In fact, uh, uh, I have an interview on Tuesday of next week with uh, Ian Bollinger, who is one of the, the founders of the psilocybin cup that they have down in San Francisco. And I'm very excited. He's an amazing researcher. And uh, they, they, the way that you can evaluate the quality of psilocybin is right down the same path of how you're going to uh, uh, discover the, the quality of your cannabis. So it, th it's, it's wonderful. I'm excited to talk with him. Um, how are people getting in touch with you right now? Um, mostly through the Big Book of Terps um, at the bigbookofterps.com. I also have a consulting website, cannabisconsultants.group, and that has been around for a long time. Um, it was formerly the Cannabis Consultant. Um, and as people have known for many years, um, I, I answer emails, I answer social media messages, um, have always tried to, you know, respond to the people who have supported me. So um, lots of ways to reach out to me and, and you can um, expect a response unless it's ridiculous. You have always been a, a gentleman and, and a true scholar. And when are you coming back to Spain or when do you think you're coming back? Within the next 12 months. Mm -hmm. So most likely for Christmas, we'll spend in, in Barcelona and then we'll be there through Spanibus and, and all that. Oh, fantastic. Well, I will look forward to seeing you when you come this yeah. way, kind sir. And I really appreciate everything you have done for me and the thousands of others who you have uh, guided gently and with great, uh, with great skill into enjoying the uh, Spanish cannabis market. And I can't wait to get into your book. Thank you, sir. Awesome. Thank you. See you soon. Take care, everyone. Oh, hey, everybody. Welcome back. What a great interview that was with Russ Hudson. Dude, I learn so much from him every time I hear him speak. But like I said, I promised you, I'm going to show you how we play a little disc ninja. This is the first hole. Check this out. So this is just like playing Frisbee golf. And once you land, it moves you to where you are. So it's like Frisbee golf, except you don't have to walk. <laughs> Look how beautiful this setting is. All right, going right down the middle. All right, here we go. All right, everyone, that's today's show. I will see you again on Saturday with Ian Bollinger from the Psilocybin Cup. Dude, it's going to be a very trippy show. I'll see you guys back then. Whoa, dude. Captain Hooter!